Well, thank you for joining us as we continue our study with Jesus along the way. And today, it's Jesus along the road, meeting a man blind from birth. We read in the Gospel of John, chapter 9, verses 1 through 12, and actually through the whole chapter. And if you have your Bibles with you, open them and let me read for you the first 12 verses. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming, when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told them. Wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen this begging man asked, Is this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open? they demanded. And he replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it in my eyes. And he told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man? they asked him. I don't know, he said. Let me give you a little bit of background from the previous chapter, John chapter 8, and from verses 12 and following. Jesus is speaking to the people. The Pharisees were around and heard, and the Pharisees began to challenge Jesus on what he was, what he was sharing. One of the things he said in verse 12 of chapter 8 is that I am the light of the world. The Pharisees are incensed with this. They are not happy with him at all, and they begin to abuse him. And in verse 48, they actually resort to name-calling. And what do they call him? They call him a Samaritan of all of the things. And recently, we looked at the Samaritan woman at the well and how much the Jews despised the Samaritans. And here were these Pharisees accusing Jesus of being a uh, being a Samaritan. They said, you're a Samaritan, you're demon-possessed, and they abused him, <clears throat> excuse me, thoroughly. And at uh, one point in verse 53, they're asking, who do you think you are to talk the way you do, to, to talk about uh, being the light of the world and this relationship with the Father? And then he talks about even Abraham, that he knows Abraham, and they abuse him again. You're not even 50 years old, and yet you claim to know Abraham. How is this possible? You are demon-possessed, you're a Samaritan, and they began to pick up stones, and they were going to, to stone him. So this is the environment that we find our account here, meeting Jesus meeting this man along the side of the road. Uh, he slipped away at the end of chapter 8. It says that Jesus slipped away, and then we get to our scripture today in John 9 and verse 1. And as he went along... As he passed by, he saw a man, a man who was blind from birth. This man couldn't see him coming. He doesn't know about Jesus passing by uh, from, from his sight. Maybe he was listening for footsteps, but of course the footsteps would not reveal who was passing by. He had no capacity to see, to observe what was going on around him. He could only listen in, and he missed so much as he sat there on the side of the road begging and not seeing anything that was going on. And I'm sure he couldn't imagine that maybe the Son of God, the Messiah, was going to pass by, that would that the Son of God would would see him there on the side of the road. He experienced, as he heard, the, the crowds passing by, but he could not, I'm sure, imagine that Jesus, the Savior of the world, would pass by and would pay any attention to him. He didn't expect Jesus. He didn't expect Jesus to know him. He didn't expect Jesus to, to care about him, to, to recognize him. And surely he did not expect Jesus to stop and to talk to him there. Never mind did he expect that Jesus was going to heal him. You know, if we just got to those first few, uh, few words there, as Jesus passed by, as Jesus went along, he saw a man. 
And you know, so many times we think that God in heaven misses us, that he doesn't see us, that he doesn't care, that he doesn't know. But I think so many times we miss him. We don't expect him. We don't expect his voice. We don't expect him to stop and talk with us. And therefore, we miss what he is doing. Jesus is not missing any of us. He does see us. He sees us wherever we are. Whatever our circumstances, he passes by and he is interested. He knows us by name, man or woman, whatever our age, he knows us and he passes by and he really longs to get our attention. But we get into this account and the disciples, as they pass by, they see this man who is blind and they ask the question, why was this man born blind? We see that in verse 2. Why was he born blind? Was it because of his sin? Was it because of his parents' sin? Help us to understand why this man is here and why he is blind. And of course it was, first off, they were only seeing a blind man. They were not seeing a uh, a person that Jesus loved. They were not seeing a soul that, that the Lord God cared about. They were just seeing a man. They were not concerned. They were just curious. How sad. But again, how easy it is for us to just pass by on the streets, in the supermarket, in a school, in our place of work, not really seeing the person, but just seeing someone, a shell. And also their comment or their question was based on their theology of sin and the misunderstanding. It was, it was cultural. And for some theological, though uh, uh, poor theology, they were misunderstanding what God, was, uh, what God had said and what God was doing. And so their assumption was that this man or his parents had done something wrong, that they had sinned. And because they had sinned, someone had sinned, then this man was born blind. Obviously, this man himself couldn't have sinned in the womb, although they had a theology that expressed that maybe he had sinned. How could he have sinned in the womb? Had he kicked too hard? But could he have had that understanding um, in the womb? It is just impossible. And again, such faulty theology. What about his parents? Had they sinned? And, um, and again, uh, blaming the parents that because they were sinners, his son was born blind as a way to, to punish them. And of course, the parents were sinners. And of course, this man, as he grew, he was a sinner. But this was not the case, uh, not, the, not the reason for his blindness. There are those scriptures in the in the Old Testament. We won't take time to look at those now, but in Exodus, in, in Numbers, in Deuteronomy, that talks about the sins of the parents being visited on the children. And that there, uh, talking about the, the sins of the fathers, really, uh, it, it appears that that's talking about a, a generation. It talks about a leadership and the consequences of a leadership of, or a generation of leadership does uh, bring consequences to the, uh, to the generations that, that are born and the generations that follow, because when they take their actions, they actually can do harm that harms, um, that harms a, a society, a culture, a city, a, a community. It can do that harm, but it's not that the parent's sin is brought now and the, and the children are paying for those sins. We can talk about that another time. And there are times, yes, in, in Scripture where we see a punishment and we, we see where Ananias and Sapphira openly uh, lied to the Holy Spirit, lied to God, and they were, they were struck dead. But that is something very, very rare. And uh, we do see that, um, that result, the consequence of their sin that came immediately. And then we need to see also that, that the, the sin that we commit does have consequences. And sometimes that is a health issue. We've spoiled our health because of our, because of our sin. But it's not a matter that God is judging us and God is trying to get us because of our sin. But in fact, it's a time where we have, we have sinned and brought something upon us. So again, back to the question, and they're talking to Jesus as a rabbi. Teacher, tell us now, who has sinned, this man uh, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And we get to the short answer. And I love this in, in verse 3, the short answer, neither one, neither this man nor his parents sinned. 
And of course, there's a bigger answer to come, but this is just the, the short one. And he continues on, this has happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. This is for the glory of God. And I'm sure they had so many questions there and they're just waiting to hear what Jesus is going to say next. For the glory of God, soon we are going to see the grace of God at work. Soon we're going to see Jesus healing uh, healing this man. Sometimes, and I'm just uh, just a little note on a little rabbit trail there, sometimes we do excuse the things that happen to us. Uh, sometimes we excuse our own sin, our jealousy, our bad judgment, uh, our poor decisions. And sometimes we just say, well, it was meant to happen. And there's so much that's avoidable in this life if we make good decisions and if we follow through with the things we know. And instead of just saying everything happens for a reason and leaving it at that, there are times we do need to, to analyze and stop and take account and take stock of what we have done and the results the, uh, that has happened because of the actions that we have taken. But what we also, also should recognize and know that every situation is an opportunity for the work of God to be displayed. <clears throat> and sometimes that's displayed in, in repentance, um, sometimes in the lack of fighting and lack of arguing, um, no seeking revenge, no trying to get even. Um, we see the glory of God coming about because of the actions that we do take when something uh, something has happened to us. We have come through. And it could be a health issue. It could be another, another action. But then we get into verse 4. And this is the heart of the matter. And it is so interesting, the answer that Jesus gives. Verse 4, as long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. And while I am in the world, I am the light of of the world. We must do the work of the one who sent me. And it's interesting here that Jesus is not saying, I must do the work, but he's speaking to his disciples, and I believe he's speaking to each of us as disciples, even in this day of age, or day and age, that we must do the work of the one who sent the Lord Jesus Christ. Always God wants to involve us in his work. We are so privileged that he does know us, that he does care about us, and he does involve us. And his work is, I'll say in this way, dependent. God, yes, he can do anything sovereignly, but at the same time, it is his pleasure and it is his plan to involve us. We must do the work of the one who sent me. What a privilege it is and what an amazing responsibility it is to serve him, to do that work of the Father. The work of the Father, and it means you, it means me, it means each of those disciples then, it means each disciple, each believer who is alive today, we must, as long as it is day, as long as there is a day on our calendar, as long as we have life and health and strength and breath, then we must do the work of the one who has sent the Lord Jesus Christ. We as the citizens of the kingdom of God, and we've been talking about that over a number of weeks, the citizens of the kingdom of God, we must be doing the work of the Father. We must be obedient to that as long as it is day. And again, as long as we have time, as long as we have life. Jesus, in his lifetime, served his Father and was obedient to his Father. And we, in our lifetime, the disciples in their lifetime, they needed to serve, they needed to do the will of the Father in their lifetime. And again, we must do the same. And I do say, as long as we have life and breath and health, but even in, in poor health, we can serve the Lord and we must serve the Lord. In life, we must serve him while we have breaths, while we have a day, while we have time, we must serve him. Even in our decline, as things change with health and abilities, we still must serve him. And I think of a, a lady who became a dear friend of mine with, with ALS. She suffered greatly in the physical, but yet she was just such a shining light 
for the kingdom of God. We're called to be that light and to called to be to be salt in our communities in in this life. And she was that very thing. There was a time when she was able to speak and she would just speak with the grace of God. And then the time came when she was not able to speak and she actually spoke through a uh, through a machine. And she would key in one letter at a time. She would key in phrases and greetings. And there were times that I would walk, walk by. And though I had seen that she was there, something else was catching my attention. And I would hear a mechanical or a, an electronic voice come from the machine saying, Hi, Pastor David. How are you? Nice to see you. And I would smile and turn, and I would see the smile in her eyes and sometimes the, the crooked smile on her face and see the love and care and grace of God. While it is still day, we must do the will of him who sent me. That's what Jesus said. He gave us a great example, and we must follow that example. And whatever our abilities, we must use them to serve him while it is day, to share the grace and love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I said before, it's an amazing responsibility, but also an amazing privilege to serve the Lord Most High. It is interesting, you know, for us in the Shushwap and the Okanagan, so many times we're caught up in the leisure, in the things that we can be doing. And, uh, you know, all seven days a week and, and all of the seasons, we're so caught up in, in the things that we, that we can enjoy. It is a retirement community. It's a place that people um, find time. And when maybe they have a little bit of cash, then it goes into boats and cottages and, and all of those things. And all of those things are good. I'm not criticizing any of them, but sometimes they can be a distraction. And Jesus' message to the disciples that day as they looked at this blind man was not about where to get lunch. It was not about the rest of the day. It was not about leisure. It was about doing the work of the, of the Father. So he continues on, Jesus does, in verse 5, I am the light of the world. And they are going to see something amazing as they see this man healed, this man who has never seen the light of day because he was born blind. Jesus, the light of the world, is about to open his eyes. But what was going to happen was even that was even more amazing was that Jesus was going to open his eyes in a spiritual way. And we'll see that just a little bit further along. So he says we must do while there is day, while we have life and strength, we must do what God has called us to do. And then he says, I am the light of the world. And then Jesus did something very, uh, very strange. We see the actual healing here. And as we have already read, he spat on the ground and he reached down and he made mud with his spit and uh, the soil from the ground. Having said this, he spit and he made mud. And then he put this mud that he'd made from the spit and, mud, uh, and, and soil and he put it on this man's eyes. This man couldn't see what was going on. I don't know if he heard Jesus as he, was, as he was preparing to spit. And as he spit, I don't know that he really got what was going on, that the, the moisture in this, in this mud had come from Jesus' spit. And that really is, is irrelevant in, in some ways. But we see this mysterious thing that Jesus did. It's strange what he did. But he did this. He put it on the man's eyes and then he told him, go and wash Go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Go and wash there. And the blind man, still not knowing what's going on, now he has this, this stuff in his eyes, and he gets somebody to lead him to this pool because he can't find his way on his own. But he goes in faith, not really understanding what was to follow, but he goes in faith and he goes in obedience to what the Lord has told him. And what is the result? We see in verse 7, he went and he washed and he came home seeing. Can you imagine that man when he went and washed in that pool and opened his eyes as the water dripped from his eyes, he saw that pool, he looked around, he saw the person that had led him to that pool and he saw everyone else around. He saw with wonder the, the, the town, the city, and he went his way seeing. We can't even imagine it. 
I can't imagine how it must have been, how exciting it must have been as Jesus uh, was, or uh, sorry, as this blind man was healed by Jesus. Now, wouldn't you think that this is just the most amazing thing that's happened and everyone would be celebrating and, and all the rest of it? But then we get into verse 8 and we see a controversy already brewing. Verse 8 here, his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? And some claim that, no, this is not him. He only looks like him. And then the man himself had to insist, I am the man. Isn't this the man that we see? Isn't he the man that we saw begging? Isn't he the man that we used to lead around or we saw someone leading him? Isn't this the man? But it was not an amazement that look what God has done. It was an amazement that there almost seemed to be a, a, a jealousy there. And some are saying, no, no, this is not even the man. It looks like him. Maybe he resembles, maybe he's a brother, but this is not the man. And they were denying that this is the, this is the guy. So then they demanded in verse 10, how then were your eyes opened? It's not high fives all around. What a celebration. Isn't this cool? Wow, look what God has done. Look what this man Jesus has done. That is not the conversation here. But they demanded, how did this happen? What? What happened? How did it happen? What went on here? And he tells the story in verse 11. <clears throat> the man they called Jesus made some mud, put it in my eyes. He told me to go to the, the pool of Siloam and wash, and I went and I washed, and then I could see. So again, there's not the amazement. There's not the questioning of, wow, is this something that God has done? Who is this Jesus in a, in a good way? But they just demanded again, where is this man? They want an accounting from this man that is called Jesus. The man says, I don't know. And some of the verses that we haven't read yet, we'll just um, briefly look into those as well. So now they've demanded, so where is this man? He says, I don't know. And so they grabbed this man, they brought him uh, to the Pharisees. They get hold of him and they take him to the religious leaders. They're still not very happy about what's going on here. Now the day on which Jesus made the mud and open the man's eyes, was a Sabbath. So they go to the religious leaders and say to them, look at this. This man was healed by this man named Jesus, and moreover, he did it on the Sabbath. And isn't it really interesting? Again, it's not praise the Lord, look what God has done. It is a matter of God has worked on the Sabbath, and we've got to stop him. Of all the times and all of the places that we don't want God working, it's on the Sabbath. Can you imagine the religi religiosity, how they were so stuck in tradition, and also they were so controlled by jealousy, that they were jealous of God. And they, they bring this man to the religious leaders because they are a bit upset. Not a bit upset, they are very angry. And we see the religious leaders are also upset because God has done a healing. And doesn't God know better than to rest on the, on the Sabbath? Doesn't God know better than this? And look at this. This changes, this changes everything. That here is God doing something for someone on the Sabbath and taking attention for himself instead of us as religious leaders. <laughs> Isn't it crazy? absolutely crazy. But can't we also get into the same place where we see someone come in and we're suspicious? Well, who is that person that, that walked in the door? I wonder what happened to them. And, um, and we're suspicious rather than sensing and, and recognizing what God is doing in a life. And immediately, they don't believe it. We don't believe it. And so they, they call for the, in verse 18, they call for the parents. And what a sideshow that, that, that happens here. They call for the parents and say, is this your son? And they say, well, of course it's our, it's our son. And yes. And they say, well, how is it that, that he is healed? Is he the one who was born blind? And they said, yes, you know, he was born blind. And then they say, well, how is it that he can see? And here are these poor parents. 
They had led their son. They had helped their son. And now the son, as an, as an adult, was being led by others and helped by others. And, and they're looking on and they're wondering. This is the first time that their son has even seen their faces. And then it's being demanded by the religious leaders, how is it that he sees? But it's an accusation. It's not, again, the, the miracle that, wow, what has God done here? But it is an accusation as if the parents have done something wrong again. Um, you know, again, in their, in their estimation that maybe it was because of their sin he was born blind, but now they're accusing the, uh, accusing the parents, how can he see? What a crazy question. And of course they say, yes, this is our son, but if you want to know how he can see, you better ask him. He's an adult. He can speak for himself and, and he can tell us, he can tell us all how it is that he can see. So then in verse 24, a second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know that this man is a sinner. This Jesus that you said has healed you, this Jesus who put mud in your eyes and sent you to the, sent you to the, uh, to the pool to, to wash in, he is a sinner. So you better give glory to God because it was a sinner that helped you here. Well, you know, at the end of the day, we do give glory to God because God, uh, not that Jesus was a sinner, but God does use uh, each of us. He used those disciples who were sinners. He used those disciples and, and, and continues to use his disciples today with our flaws. He continues to use us. And we do need to give glory to God because God does work through imperfect, uh, imperfect people. But they really had the wrong end of the stick when they were talking about Jesus. How is it that this man, is really their question, how is it that this man who, who claims so many things, who claims he knows, uh, knows Abraham, who claims he's the light of the world, who claims he's here doing his, his father's work, how is this man, uh, how is it that this man has healed you? So really they were, they were criticizing and, and <clears throat> attacking Christ in their comments. But now we find the reply of this man who has his eyes opened. Verse 25, he replies, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But the one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. And he still is amazed. And he spent, I'm sure, the rest of his life, he probably didn't even want to close his eyes when he slept at night because he was still so amazed at this miracle that God had brought about in his life where he could see. And every morning as he awoke, I wonder if he stirred and wondered, am I still seeing or was this just a dream? But he opened his eyes and he could still see. And so he's telling these, these religious leaders, I don't know. I really don't know what you're, you are, what you're talking about. Whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But all I know is that I can see. And then they asked him, what exactly did he do to you? How is it that he opened your, your eyes? That's in, in verse 26. And then he goes on, it really is quite comical. Uh, verse 27, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? And then he gives them a little dig. Do you want to become his disciples too? That's all I know is he put the spit on my eyes. He sent me to wash and I can see. But you guys are asking so, so many questions. You still, or you seem to, to want to dig so deep to really understand this miracle. Maybe you want to be his disciples. Well, that just sent them going. And in, in, uh, in verse 28, they hurled insults at him. And then they said, not us, but you are his disciple. You're the one who is his disciple. We follow Moses. We, we know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. And then the man re responds again in verse 30. Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, but yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And to this they replied, You were steeped in sin at birth, and how dare you lecture us? And then they threw him out. So they just hurled insults at him. They got angry with him. They call him a sinner. They call him a bad man. 
because he is just speaking what God has done for him here. A lot of it, he still is trying to figure it out. He doesn't have the theology for it. He doesn't have the understanding for it, but he understands my eyes are open. And when I saw that man after my eyes were open, I didn't see him as a bad man. But they, again, they're angry and they they begin to to yell at him, you're a sinner, just as they abused Jesus in the previous chapter. They yell at him, you are a sinner. Don't you lecture us. Don't you tell us anything. And then they threw him out. They didn't want to see him anymore. They wanted to get, they wanted to get rid of him. But the beautiful thing, the story doesn't end there. In verse 35 and on, it says, Jesus heard that he had been thrown out. And Jesus came and he met with that man and he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? And the man doesn't really fully understand the question. And he said, I don't really understand. Who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus said, you're looking at him. You're hearing from him. And then the man said, Lord, I believe. There in faith, he turned to the Lord Jesus Christ as his Lord, as his Savior. He recognized Jesus for who he is. And his first reaction after that, it says, Lord, I believe, and then he worshiped. How important that we follow our belief with our worship, that we don't just say in our heads that, yes, I believe, but truly we put our faith and our trust and we worship the Lord Jesus Christ. We worship him, King of kings and Lord of lords. So this man, though his eyes were opened, we see this transformation that comes to him spiritually as he trusts in the Lord excuse me, as he trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ and he says to the Lord, I believe. How simple it is. And yes, we have been talking about being born again, as as Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. We must accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And we must trust him. And we must worship him with all of our hearts, with all of our beings, and we must serve him. But we also see how simple it is as we share that message, as we come to, to someone and as we share the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he opens their eyes, opens their eyes spiritually to understand how simple it is that right then and there they can become the sons, the daughters of the Most High God and come to him in faith and begin to worship him. And how important, as I say so many times, it is important and it's so strange because uh, we cannot worship together at this time. We can do that from our separate homes and we can, we can worship together in that way. And it is so important that we gather together as the body of Christ, as the family of God, as the, as the church in our local communities. It's so important. But at the same time, it's important that we worship him again in all of our lives. And there are those times that we just stop and maybe we do it quietly, maybe we do it audibly, but we stop and we worship him. Worship him who opened our spiritual eyes and turned us from blind people to people who are seen. So again, we see this beautiful transformation. His life was never the same. Here he was, a newborn soul born into the kingdom of God. Lord, I believe, and he worshiped. I want to go back to verse 1 just for a moment as we, as we close, as we conclude. Verse 1, as he went along, he saw a man. As he goes along today, he sees us. He sees a woman. He sees a man. He sees a girl. He sees a boy as he goes along. And sometimes we're kept from recognizing Sometimes because of our own inhibitions, our own belief systems, we don't even want to recognize that Jesus is along that road. He is along the road. He is on the journey. And he wants us to invite him to stop and talk. As he went along, he saw a man. We looked a couple of weeks ago at Nicodemus. And Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. By all appearances, he was a man that was well put together, religiously, socially, financially. Everything was good for him.
But Jesus saw a man in need of his eyes being opened. And then recently we also looked at the woman at the well, Samaritan woman. Not like Nicodemus at all, well put together, but here is a woman whose life was in shambles. But Jesus at the well saw a woman. He didn't ignore her. He didn't, um, he didn't reject her because she was a Samaritan or because she was a woman. But at the well, Jesus saw a woman. And now we see on the side of the road, Jesus sees a man. Be confident that he sees you. As you're isolated in your homes, maybe as you're driving in your car, whatever is going on in your life, whatever the cry of your heart, whatever the circumstances, he sees you. Open your eyes to see him and to invite him on your journey. Many of you, most of you that I'm talking to today that know the Lord and love the Lord, don't feel rejected. Don't feel that he has left you. And just as we <clears throat> read a few minutes ago, also in our call to worship, the Lord is my shepherd. He is with you in the dark valleys. He is with you beside the still waters. And he is there to nourish you and care for you. And for those of you going through problems, whether they're health issues, uh, right now so many financial issues as places are closing, layoffs are coming, he sees a man. He sees a woman. And he wants to come near if you'll open your eyes, if you'll invite him to stop. Whatever is going on in your life, it is not a punishment. He is not looking at you and trying to chastise you and beat you. He wants to come and journey with you through, uh, through whatever it is that you're going through. <clears throat> the disciples asked the question, Who sinned? And Jesus answered straight, it's not about sin, whether this man or his parents. For Nicodemus, for the woman at the well, it was not about their sin, but it was all for the glory of God. Invite him in. Let him into your situation. Let him into your, to your den, to your living room, to your deck, to your car, wherever you are. Let him in for his glory and watch what he's going to do. Obey him. Walk with him. Allow him to walk with you. Walk in faith. Reach out to him in prayer. Call on him. He is ready to hear your call. Just as the blind man was told, in faith go and wash. Listen for Christ's voice, giving you the instruction, be obedient and act in faith and your eyes will be opened to the new things that God has got in store. This is an exciting time because I just wonder the first day that we're able to get together down on Shushwap, what's it going to be like? I think for sure, I know, it'll be a time of rejoicing as we come together and we hear the testimonies and we say, look what God has done. Today, just say, Lord, I believe. And... In the quietness, maybe you're on your own, maybe two of you at home or three, however many are there, but say, Lord, I believe and worship him. Amen. He will give you grace for the journey and the journey he's, uh, that we're all on now. He is giving us grace day. His mercies are new every morning. Amen. Receive this blessing now. The blessing of God Almighty. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Look forward to communicating with each of you through the week and again next Sunday.